All righty. So let me expand this a little bit. All right. So we've got, uh, what is it? I guess three new people tonight. Yay! So you <laughs> yeah. guys can introduce yourselves to everybody else. I think uh, most of the folks from Joyce Center know all three of you, but some of the folks from uh, not here in El Paso may not, well, I'm sure they don't know who you are. I'm going to say might not, but I'm sure they don't know who you are. So just let them know who you are. Uh, just come on off mute if you're on mute and just tell us who you are and we'll go from there. Hey, I'm Nia, a new member to the Joy Center. Yay! Excited. Hey, Mia. It's nice to hey, meet you. It's me, Noah. Both of you are talking at the same both time. Both of you are talking at the same time. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's me, Noah. Hey, Noah. Noah. And, and, and charisma. It's my first time, and I'm excited. Yes. Welcome, Charisma. Nia, we can't really see you. Yay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> we won't bite. Okay. <laughs> All righty. So we're going to see if we can finish talking about the uh, stand of pride tonight. Mm -hmm. That as the last couple of weeks, uh, I won't make any promises. <laughs> we'll talk about what the Holy Spirit wants us to talk about. I gave him free reign. So if he decides to take us in another direction, like he's done the last couple of weeks, that's where we'll go. But we'll try. So a quick recap. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about uh, Lucifer and how he was cast out because of his pride. And we explained, we talked through his uh, five I will statements and how those I will statements were reflective of the kind of pride that uh, God doesn't appreciate. Uh, I, I made the point that uh, not all pride is bad. Some pride is good. When you take pride and doing something that's uh, admirable and you couch that pride in the fact that you didn't do it all on your own, but you give God the credit for it. There's nothing wrong with that type of pride and, and being proud with what you've done through the uh, power of uh, God and Jesus Christ. Uh, there's the verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so when you do those all things, there's nothing wrong with being proud of having done them, so long as you know that it was through God's power that you did it. The pride that uh, God hates, though, is the pride that says, I did this all on my own. God had nothing to do with it. I don't give God any credit for it. That's when God uh, takes offense at that type of pride. And uh, Bishop said something today that I thought uh, meshed very well with what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, if anybody remembers, he talked about the difference between unity and what? Unification. Um, I mean, uniformity. I'm sorry. Yes, unity and uniformity. So I thought that was very good in, in talking about the difference between the two types of pride. Uh, I'll, I'll give... Before I, I jump into it, does anybody want to take a, a shot at what you think I'm talking about when I say that uh, unity versus uniformity is kind of like the uh, two different types of pride that we just talked about, the good pride and the bad pride? I'll give you a minute to think about it. But as soon as he said it, it jumped uh, right out at me that this is the same type of thing we're talking about here. Unity, uh, to me, what I got, it was um, a group effort were combined together to get a task done, to work together. And being unified, it's more of a, uh, it wasn't so much as a group, 
but as the person taking action to do it, you know, they are going to do it, but it was the um, intent behind it, I guess that would be better to say, was. Okay. So which one? Are you talking is, about, were you talking about, it? of course, I wasn't there in service today as with the children's church, but I don't know what he may have said in there. Um, uh -huh. but are you talking about in terms of pride, where you were saying there's, there's a, you know, being, having pride or in, in terms of being prideful? Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. And I'm, I'm saying that the unity versus the uniformity can be related to those two different things. And which one, one is the good type of pride and one is the uh, bad type. But which one I'm asking, do you think is related to unity? And which one would be related to uniformity? Unity was the good type. Uniformity was the bad. Okay. Can you expound on that? Or if no, anybody wants to help. <laughs> anybody else want to help? I know you did already. Uh, uh, I was going to say, um, well, because he was, he was really expanding on the fact that like God did not create us all to be the same. Mm -hmm. so when we're when we're like united in faith we're mm -hmm. we're all in alignment with faith as we come together because of faith so as because he was talking about the difference between faith and believing right so i guess that would be mm -hmm. the same the same difference between being having pride and being prideful okay uh no i saw you raised your hand i think Yes, um, to me, unity is like the body of Christ as a whole doing something to build up the kingdom of God and uniformity. It just, to me, it sounds like conformity, which can be conforming to the ways of the world. That's another thought. I hadn't thought of that. Mm hmm I also wrote in my notes from this um, morning message that um, that it brings us into unity with God and that we work, uh, unity is, is working in agreement. Okay. So I, I agree with you that all of you, that that is absolutely the, the, uh, the right type of the pride thing. Again, um, mm -hmm. You're giving God the credit for it. So you're saying that you didn't do it by yourself. You, you did it through the power of God or the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of Jesus. So we're unified and working together towards what it was that we did that we take pride in. Um, but what I saw is the uniformity is what Lucifer was chasing after. Why do I say that? Uniformity means to be the same as, right? Not to be united, but to be the same as. So he wanted to be the same as God. That was his bad pride. He didn't want to be in line with God. He wanted to be equal to God. So that uniformity that he was seeking for is the bad type of pride that doesn't give God credit and takes credit for itself, saying, I don't need to be like God. I mean, I don't need to be in unity with God. I can just be my own God. And so that is where I saw the difference between the two. I'm not saying that that's what the way the that Bishop was talking about. I'm saying that that's the way we can apply those two terms to what we're talking about here. Everybody see the difference that I'm making there? Being in unity with, with God is giving God the credit, but being in uniformity with God is not being unified with him. It's being the same as him which is the sin of pride that the Lucifer showed in the uh, in antiquity that caused him to be cast out. Right. 
Elder, may I share something? Sure. I also see like unity as being like Christ minded, Christ likeness, mm -hmm. you know, having that mind of Christ, you know, because if you're in unity, you're in unity with the triune of God. Correct. So, you know, that unity is all one. And so just as, you know, Jesus was saying, you know, just as the father is in him, and his spirit is in him. They were all one, all in agreement, all of the same. And so having that Christ-like mind, you're also in that unity. But the, the uniformity, you're just thinking of yourself. You're trying to form as just as a you. You're not trying to right. be in union or in, you know, you're just... You know, you're focused on only, it's like selfishness. Right. It's just trying to please self only. Correct. Being like self-centered, like self-centered is, I guess, uh, another way that I would, you know, to me, putting it like, you know, a definition of or a synonym of uniformity, you know, I would see it as self-centeredness. Right, right. Yeah, another way I could uh, bring it up uh, or bring out the difference is, uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of the... Uh, the old term of separate but equal. Unity means being together. Uniformity means being separate but equal. So that's another way of, of thinking of the, the difference that I'm trying to bring out here is I'm not saying that uni uh, uniformity is bad. I'm saying that it can be bad and uh, when it comes to pride, uh, it would be a bad thing to say that I'm as good as God is, which is what uh, Lucifer was saying. So it was that idea of being as good as God and not needing God is what caused Lucifer to be cast out of uh, heaven and cast down to earth. So then we went on from there. We talked about uh, all the different uh, five I am statements. And I'm not going to recap all of those. Uh, you can go to the, uh, the YouTube channel and you can watch the video or listen to it. Uh, when we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but we went into a, a, a very detailed discussion of those five I am statements. And I thought that that was a very good enlightening uh, discussion that we had. It was one that wasn't where I was planning to go in, in such detail, but that's where we were led. And, and so I would uh, commend you to look at that or listen to that and get all that you can out of that study. So last week, I wanted to go through uh, the other part of the document that I had sent out talking about the uh, the traits of those who are proud, the bad type of pride, and the uh, fate of those who are proud. And as we were going through the traits, that's when we got sidetracked last time, talking about uh, what was in Genesis chapter three. I won't go back into that unless somebody wants to. So if, if anybody wants to, we can, we can delve into that again. But what, what I would like to try to do tonight though, is to jump into uh, talking about what's the fate of those who are proud. And as I was saying before everybody joined, uh, when there were just a couple of us, um, what we want to talk about is what happens to us when we have that same type of self-centered pride that Lucifer had, which caused him to be cast out of heaven. But since we're not Lucifer and we're not in heaven, uh, we can't be cast out. But what can happen to each one of us if we have that wrong type of pride? So that's what I want to talk about tonight. So before we jump into that, uh, I'll just open it up. Does anybody have any specific questions or issues or comments of anything that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks up to now uh, that you want to get clarified before we jump into the the, the fate of those who are proud. 
Just any loose ends that you want to get tied up? Um, I do have a question, but I feel like you're going to end up answering it, Elder. Um, right. For those who like, how can I word it? Like they put on a facade like, oh, yes, you know, I'm giving honor to God. But like deep, like in their heart and like in the back of their mind, they're, they truly aren't fully giving themselves. Is that that's going to be touched tonight, isn't it? Uh, not necessarily, because that's it, that isn't necessarily a result of pride. That mm -hmm. may be a, 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 the result of something else. Uh, so it, it wasn't necessarily something I was going to talk about, but uh, let's hold that one. And if it comes up, we'll, yeah, we, we can discuss it. But uh, I will make sure I write that down because that may be something we have to uh, touch on later. But uh, give me a little bit more of a, a discussion of what it is that you're, you you want and clarification on. Um, just like basically for those who who give honor and thanks to God, but still deep in their heart, like they don't fully mean it. Not giving true uh, honor and thanks to God. Yes, yes, yes. Like there's like a lingering like in the back of their mind where they're like, uh, I still want all the credit for this. I don't really want to truly. Oh, give, I, I see what you're saying. To God. I, I yes, yes, saying. yes. Okay. So that, that is related to pride. Yes. You don't want to give up any of the honor for yourself. You say you're giving honor to, to God for it, but you're really not. All right. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll touch on that. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? All right. So let's go ahead and get started then. Um, and what I've gotten here uh, on the screen is I've broken down the consequences. I've gone through scripture and I pulled out uh, uh, several passages that uh, lay out what can happen to a person or what will happen to a person who is prideful according to the uh, scripture. And I, I divided them into two groups. Uh, one is they incur the wrath of God. And the second one, number two, is they incur dire life consequences. So we're gonna start with the one that seems to be the, the most uh, consequential first, and that is they incur the wrath of God. But uh, I, I think it, it may be interesting to see that those consequences in, the, in some cases might seem to be less consequential to some people uh, than the, the life consequences are. But we'll talk about why that might be the case. So incurring the wrath of God, I started off with 2 Chronicles 32 and 26. It says, notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. So because of his pride, Hezekiah was afraid that the wrath of God would fall on him which is an indication that that is a consequence of pride. So uh, as the lead in to this whole section, what is your definition of the wrath of God, anybody? Because we'll, we'll go through it and we'll see what the, the Bible says are the things that I consider to be the wrath of God related to pride. But what do you think the wrath of God is? Judgment. Okay, judgment. Now, that's a good one. That's an interesting one. Um, is, is judgment God's wrath or does judgment lead to God's wrath? It leads to God's wrath. Or is it the result of God's wrath? Mm. In the end, we all will be judged. <laughs> yes, we will. We will all be judged. 
So what's the relationship between that judgment and wrath, God's wrath? Well, judgment, I guess if you're following after Jesus and you're being judged, then it's okay. You get to go to a good place. Um, you get <laughs> live okay. eternity with him. But if it's bad and you get judged, then you get to spend eternity in the lake of fire. So okay. judgment doesn't necessarily have to be bad or a negative consequence. Correct. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the, the things from him is that when God removes himself from our life, then things don't go very well for us. <laughs> you yes. might have, have a good period at one time, but sooner or later, it's all going to fall apart. So you're going to have to go back to him or you're going to just continue to spiral down and eventually you know where you'll go. Yeah. Right. You brought up something that's actually the last one on this list. Uh -huh. uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. You said when okay. God removes himself from our life, that's actually on the list. Okay. Uh, but it's the last yeah. one. Go ahead, Deacon. No, I, I was just going to say uh, that was one thing. I think it's more of an action or something. To me, wrath is like it's a, it's a punishment. It's an action of something he's done. It's a okay. consequence. It's made. It's a, it's a punishment or uh, some sort of action. And probably removing himself is one where we're incurring no longer his protection. Okay. He, which he kind of where things can be allowed, but he, but because of his wrath was brought against people, he may have moved himself from it, or he's done something because most of the wrath had you know this sense sense of where you look uh, with um, when he was talking with Moses and and uh, Miriam and so forth that he put leprosy on the person um, on those sort of things. So a wrath is more of like a where he had sent the vipers out. Or something because his wrath he was he was hot against them so even when he told moses on the mountain he says listen you need to get down there because they're building some things i'm about to i'm about to you know lack of a better word he said i'm about to get rid of them. moses interceded but a wrath is going to be something he he did in terms of whether he sent the serpents on there whether he sent the plague whether he sent the something so to me it's an action punishment consequence okay. Or something that's good i like that anybody else i did a search on uh, god's wrath on you version and it talks about in jeremiah and in psalms about his uh his fury and his anger being poured out okay fury and anger those are pretty uh consequential words. So can we say then that uh, wrath is uh, punishment that comes as a result of God's fury and anger? Yes or no? I would say yes. What? Now, is it of uh, one type or can they be many different types of uh, ways that his wrath is poured out? Because Deacon talked about a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Would all those be God's wrath? I think it can be different kinds of things because just as we saw in Exodus with the 10 plagues, they weren't all the same. Okay. So I, I would agree with that. Uh, and, and that's what we're going to see as we go through this. I just wanted us to, to get that in our, uh, our our thought process right off the bat is that God's wrath uh, that gets incurred because of pride doesn't just exhibit itself in one type of a, a punishment or a uh, an action on, against someone. That there are different ways that it gets shown. And it may be shown multiple ways against the, the same person but it's still the same wrath of God. And it starts off, I start, tried to start it off with 
what some people might call might think of as not very consequential, but um, it could in fact be consequential. Uh, it's Psalm 138 and 6, it says, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Now, first off, we got to understand what it means by know, knoweth afar off. What do you think that means, anybody? He separates himself or he distances himself from those that are proud. That's it. That's exactly right. Um, I guess the, uh, a good example, a counter example, is we talk about having close friends. This would be the uh, kind of the opposite of that. It's a far away enemy. So it's basically saying that God separates himself from us. And this goes back to what Terry was saying earlier about when God separates himself out from our lives, then uh, we can be in a, a, a bad situation. And this is the first thing that uh, he does is he separates himself from you. Elder, I have a question. Yes. So y'all were t talking about, you know, the wrath of God being anger as one of them. But in Isaiah, he talks about you know, for a moment, I was angry with you, and I've allowed this, this to happen. But with great compassion, I will extend my grace to you. I'm like paraphrasing. But, you right. know, you see it in Isaiah 41, 42, throughout those scriptures, especially throughout like 41, 42, 43, 44, you see that repeatedly happening. So do you, is that like God's wrath? I mean, God has his wrath on his people, but then he goes with great compassion. You know, I will extend, you know, show my mercy and I'll draw you back to me. So it's like when he shows his wrath, it's like he shows it, but then he also brings his people back to him at the same time. So it's like, is that like two different things? Are you still, is that still the wrath of God when uh, he does that? I wouldn't necessarily call that wrath. Wrath to me is more uh, the difference between anger and wrath, I guess, would be um, you're initially angry, but uh, you can be, um, what's the right word? Uh, your wrath can be, uh, your anger can be repealed, I guess. Uh, wrath comes when the person consistently and continuously gives you reason for anger and never tries to resolve that anger to your, uh, again, I'm trying to think of the right word. Um, even though you give them an opportunity over and over again to uh, be reconciled to you. They don't take advantage of that. That's when your anger turns to wrath. So in the, the verses you're talking about, God's wrath, God's anger hadn't reached the level of wrath yet. So he's still giving them opportunities to make things right. It's only once they've gotten to the end of that, that he says, okay, I'm done with you. And, and again, that kind of goes back to what, uh, excuse me, what Terry was saying in the last verse that I have in this section, uh, and it's one that you've probably seen, uh, Romans 1, 28 through 32, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. He doesn't do that the first time you 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 anger him. That's because you continue over and over and over and over and over again to continue to do things that are angering to him and don't try to make amends for it. Don't uh, repent. Don't try to change your ways. After a while, he says, "I'm not. You're not wasting your time on changing for me. 
So I'm not wasting my time on you anymore. And that's when his anger becomes wrath. So it was a good question. You know, good question. Very good question. You know, as you were saying that, I was, was thinking of something because again, I and I think was this is going back, and I think that's what we're trying to discuss tonight, because I think there's sometimes there could be degrees of wrath. Um, because when I think of wrath, I think of like like you're saying now, there a, a, a final judgment or an ultimatum in a, in a sense but just because he may have you know from the examples are sort of given you see that throughout the bible and i think what miss nicole was saying when she was reading that scripture that he had a wrath that that can be a consequence of something there's going to be consequences but he didn't kill them off all he get he just said okay these are going to be things but i believe because because god remembers his covenant and that that he has it, and that's his love for us. That's the love. He's like, okay, well, some, of, but there are consequences along, you know, along with sin. And so I was just thinking about certain things in terms of how he, um, for an example, I think of, for an example, he remembers his covenant, but in the beginning, when Noah was not Noah on here, the Noah in the Bible. <laughs> When Noah, God, because he said that the wickedness of man was, you know, time that he said, I, he said, what, I'm paraphrasing, but he said he, he was, um, where he, 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 he didn't want to make, you know, he said, I, I was, paraphrasing. he didn't, you know, he was sorry he made man. I, he didn't say it in that word, but because of the sin. So of course he destroyed the earth, everything on the earth, he destroyed, but yet his promise was done through Noah and he recreated things. So to me, that was a wrath of an anger, but it was still love that he said, I'm gonna do this because I see there's certain things, but I still have a promise. So to me, it's like, there's still certain types of, maybe in degrees, but God is still love, but there are consequences. And so, you know, just as what David did, David, he was upset about David taking a census. And David he repented. He was a man after God's own heart. He repented. But yet there was still a plague and there was still consequences. But he said, well, he gave him a choice of what type of punishment you want. And he didn't want God to separate himself from him. He says, listen, don't put me in the don't put me in the wrath of other men. God, I would take your punishment. Right. And he, but he said the plague and everything. So you see that. And so I guess sometimes, I guess you're trying to, to me, it's just trying to rick route like if there are, you know, the degrees of wrath, but I know God's wrath is some sort of punishment or consequence, Correct. but yet not his ultimate. Absolutely. Because even, even when he wiped out the earth with, when it started over with Noah and his people, in this in his family that was a wrath he killed off everybody yep all but eight of them yeah and then it left the eight on the earth to replenish everything so i don't know that's a looks like Neil, you got your hand up yeah i was just i was just gonna say um before everybody had joined i was talking to uh elder babers about that too um because i had started reading the book of acts and i was reading about like you know how how when you lie when you know when you've been you know baptized with the holy spirit that that's i like to think that that's a consequence of god too you know because he sends his spirit into us to you know do his work pray and and all that good stuff it was um the story of um it wasn't a story but uh Ananias and his wife um it, at that time I guess they were everybody had sold all their uh all their belongings all their properties and all their land and um they were supposed to give all the money to uh I believe it was Peter and Paul don't quote me I think I think that's who it was that's to um, the apostles yes and they he I guess him and so he ultimately made the decision to hold back on some of the money and only gave a little bit 
and his wife knew about it. And of course the Holy Spirit told, um, told the apostles and they confronted him. And instead of just confessing like, Hey, I held money back. He was just like, yeah, you know, that's what I did. And he dropped dead. And so did his wife just, she, and she only dropped dead just from knowing about it and not speaking up. So I like to think that that's definitely a, a, a consequence of having pride. Now it, it really had me told, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, not dropping dead. They didn't have to give out the money. They, it was their land, and they're the ones said that they gave it all. The thing was right. is that they lied about it. They could have just said, we decided to give this amount. They didn't have to give them a reason, but since they lied and said that they gave it all, that's why that came up on them. Right, right, right. I, mm -hmm. I was, because I was thinking the same thing. I was like, why you didn't just say... The real reason why you kept the money back, you didn't have to lie, you know? Pride, pride. They was too prideful to, because uh, everybody else was giving all. And mm -hmm. they said yes. that they was giving all, but they wasn't. Yeah. Because of pride. And see, that, that's interesting. It never says that everybody else gave all. Well, that's true, but they said that they would. So they right. wanted to make themselves look elevated. Correct. That yeah. was the issue, mm -hmm. was that they okay. wanted to make themselves look like they were being as good as or better than everybody else by giving everything. Exactly. So it could have been that everybody else said, yeah, we sold our land and here's 10% of it. But That's they didn't true. want to be just mm -hmm. the 10 percenters. They wanted to be the 100 percenters. Yeah, yeah. And like on um, Millennium Sunday. You know, it's like you give your money, but some people give more, you know, but they're not doing it out of pride. You know, if they are doing it out of pride, then uh, they better look out. But <laughs> but I don't think there's nobody standing up in the church and saying, well, I'm giving um, blah, 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 you know, so everybody can go, yay, you know, you're, you're so great. You're so wonderful. That's when they'll be looking for praise for themselves. If they're using it as a testimony, how God has blessed them so much that they're able to give more, then that's not a prideful way. They're not right. doing it in pride. Good discussion. Nia, take your hand down. You still got your hand up. Thank you. All right. So, um, but yeah, a lot of good discussion there. And absolutely, I, I think that there's different levels of uh, where God's wrath is. And that's, again, kind of what I wanted to show through all the different verses that we have here. Um, but we talked about, first off, he's he turns his back on you. He's, he sees you afar off. And then it says that he hates you. That's Proverbs 6, 16 through 18. Now, what does it mean to have the Lord hate you? I don't want to know. Um, but it says that there are, there are seven things that uh, are abomination to him, six things that he hates, and seven that are an abomination to him. And one of them, the very first one is a proud look, then a lying tongue which can be based on pride. In fact, the story of Ananias and Sapphira is those two things together, pride and, and lying. Then uh, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises it, wicked imaginations, feet that are swift to run to mischief, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things are things that God hates. So if you're proud, it says, God hates that. So he turns his back on you. He shows you his hate, not his love which is something because the Bible says God is love, not hate. So you got to really have done something to make God hate you. And pride is one of those things. It says he is not just hating you, but he's against you. So now it ratchets up a level. He's not just hating you, but he's taking action against you. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud, saith the Lord God of hosts. For thy day is come and the time that I will visit thee. Someone has something in the chat. Oh, okay.
what do you think this verse means? Jeremiah 50 and 31. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most proud, for thy day is come, the time that I will visit thee. Is this a visit that you should be looking forward to? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, um, this last week I read about, um, I think it may have been in Zechariah, but I'm not sure, about God wanting them to go back and rebuild the, the church um, when they got exiled to um, Babylon. And then he released them. And then he turned his wrath on the, the people who held them captives because God said they went further than what he wanted them to. He wanted the, um, them to be judged, but he didn't want them to be treated so cruelly. And so, and I think that's because the other um, nations had so much pride and just want to bombard the children of, of um, God down that um, that's why they treated them so cruelly while they was in captivity. I think you're speaking from Jeremiah, his prophecy that uh, after 70 years, they would go back and rebuild it. And then he would uh, punish those who had taken them into captivity. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Okay. But yeah, that, that's a, a good example. So yeah, it's not something <laughs> you want God. You don't want to be waiting on that visit from God. Absolutely not. It's not like us waiting for Jesus to come back and knowing that it's going to be a great time for us. This is, uh, you know, there ain't nothing good going to come out of this visit if, if God's told you this. Uh, your time's about up, and uh, I'm going to be there tomorrow. It's kind of like your boss telling you. Well, Jesus even told a parable about a uh, a steward who his boss told him, uh, your time's up. You're not going to be my steward no more. I'm coming tomorrow, and we're going to go over the books, and you're going to have to take, make an account of everything that you've done. And that steward went out and... Uh, made some deals. He uh, saved himself, but uh, he had to do some wheeling and dealing to do it. In this case, there ain't nobody you can make any deals with that's going to soften the blow here. God tells you that your time's up and he's coming. You can just depend that uh, you're not going to be doing well after this. Psalm 119 and 21, thou has rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do error from thy commandments. So now it's saying that he's not just against you, he's cursed you. Now, what does a curse mean? Anybody, what do you think it means to be cursed? Is it a good thing? Come on, guys, just say no. <laughs> it's not a good thing. <laughs> Well, no, of course not. It's not. It's not a good thing to be cursed. And if God curses you, then you have definitely, I believe, fallen on His wrath. Right. Now, this uh, makes me think of uh, Genesis chapter twelve. Anybody remember what that says? This was God talking to Abraham. Bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. Mm. Right. So God is saying that he cursed you. So does that mean that who, who can take away that curse now that God has cursed you? Only God can. Right. Because God's curse, cursing those who cursed you is essentially a curse against the curse and God's curse trumps anybody else's curse, but nobody can trump God's curse here. All right. Like what, who is that prophet where that those kids made fun of and was that was Elijah. Elisha. And then, yes. Elisha. Yeah. Elisha. Yeah. Elisha that. And then the lion came and ate him because they were teasing him. The Correct. Bear. Yeah. The bear. Yeah. She bear. Yeah. 
And so that was just because, you know, if you touch his anointed, then you're going to be cursed. Right. Mm -hmm. And next one is Proverbs 16 and 5. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Thou hand join in, though hand join in, in hand, he shall not be unpunished. An abomination to the Lord. It could be like what Nina was talking about when we first came on about people in the church. How can they be one way, but, you know, pretend to be this other way? And I think this is it. As the pride in their heart. They pretend to worship God, but right. they have yes, different like motives. They, they like pretend like they're there, but like mm -hmm. like Bishop says, like they're not, what is that verse when he was talking about doing it with faith and truth? Uh, yeah. Looking for those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. In truth. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Don't quote me. I'm still a little new to this. <laughs> That's okay. You made the connection, though. Yes. 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 Uh, what is it? Uh, John 4, 23, when he was saying, serve God in spirit and truth. Is that it? 23 through 24? Oh, I don't know. Yes. Where he's talking where he goes to the woman with the well, and he says that he's looking for those worshipers. We'll for those that will serve him in spirit and in truth. Yeah, right. that's it. Yeah, I even looked at it in my Bible just now. Just so, oh. I, could, <laughs> so I could be squared away. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I, I was really waiting for the next verse to talk about uh, that whole deal of uh, oh. withholding your... Uh, I guess withholding the honor to yourself as opposed to giving God credit for it. Mm. This is what I see is, is that that's why I said we, we'd get to that and talk about that. But okay. I see it as Leviticus in Leviticus 26 and 19. This is okay. just me. And I will break the pride of your power and I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Mm. This to me is the result of that. If you withhold mm. God's, uh, if you withhold credit from God, uh, what he's saying is he's going to withhold everything from heaven from you. Mm. Jeez. Not, Not just from good. heaven, but from earth. It's mm -hmm. going to, what I see here is uh, the image I see is a wall of iron separating you from heaven oh. and the, the earth itself being covered in a sheet of brass. So you can't get anything out of the earth. Nothing. Can't grow anything right. or anything. Yeah. You're standing on metal, looking up at metal, and you're st stuck in the middle. And there's wow. nothing you can get out of either place. That's wow. what so, God is saying is, is up for you. If you withhold from him the credit that he, he deserves mm -hmm. uh, and the honor that he deserves for what he's mm -hmm. helping you do. So like every time God uses you and you not give him the credit for him using you as that vessel and you taking the credit on your own, that's the result of it. The that's what I see as a result. That's what I see this verse right. is telling me. Is that he's shutting, up, he's shutting off heaven and he's shutting off the earth from you. Right. No, that's just, yeah, people who don't do that, that's just it's it's always God because like he's the one who distributes the gifts to you. You don't pick and choose your gifts or your talents or whatever. It's like he's the one who gives that to you. So that's not yours to begin with. Right. And when we've gotten to this point now, he's shut off everything from you. Then we get begin to see the consequences in your life. And we're almost to the end of this section and into the one about the uh, life consequences, because all of those life consequences are the result of God just giving up on you and me and so tired of you that he didn't do anything for you anymore. And he starts to rain down, not 
not just not rain down blessings, but starts to rain down curses on you. So the first thing that I'm seeing there is he's cutting off all the flattering lips, meaning that mm -hmm. you, you can't get anything done anymore. So you don't have anything to be proud of anymore. Wow. You can't claim that you did this because you ain't doing nothing. And you can't do anything. Mm. No matter what you do, everything collapses. No matter what you try, nothing succeeds. Mm. The next one, he, he says, I will cut off him that hath in high look and a proud heart. Will not I suffer? So you're cut off. You cut off from all your honor. You cut off from all of your uh, prosperity. You cut off from everything. Proverbs 15, 25 says, I will destroy the house of the proud. Timothy 3 and 6 says, uh, he will fall into the condemnation of the devil. So remember I said that we aren't Lucifer, so we can't be cast out of hell. But everything else that happened to him after that, uh, we're in the same boat as he is now. Which means what? After being cast out of heaven, what's uh, Lucifer's next level of punishment? A lake of fire. Right. So that's where we're headed. Mm. And then we already read this from giving over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. That means your, your mind itself becomes altered. And you start doing things that you shouldn't be doing things that are damaging to yourself, to your family, to your future, to your prosperity, to your health. Mm -hmm. That's that reprobate mind, that reprobate mind that can think of and do nothing good. Mm -hmm. So the word convenient, that was like, this was like some words, they had one meaning at one period of time but the meaning is different now oh no that it means what it means uh, it's still the same meaning huh so what is convenient which things are easy they're there they're available uh no but, convenient really yeah. is uh something that's of value of, that's good okay now, when you, you're oh, thinking of a convenience convenient. store, you're thinking of a convenience store, right? No, I always thought convenient just mean that it was available. And it says, you know, this is not convenient, not so much as a store, but it was just handy. Well, let's look it up. <laughs> really? Where are we going to look it up at? I don't know. Am I the only one mind? that? Okay, am I the only one thought convenient means, you know, readily at hand or easy to do? No, I, I was thinking so the same thing. Yeah, I was on the same, like, easy, accessible, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Not something not Like difficult. a microwave. That's microwave is convenient. You don't have to wait as long. <laughs> yeah. What'd you say, Noah? Uh, not difficult. That's what I thought. Yeah. <laughs> There, I wasn't going to say anything because I wanted you to stand alone. <laughs> <laughs> or like simplicity. You know, I was thinking of as simplicity. Okay, if I can get my phone to act right, look it up. Okay, the word is. Convenient, C-O-N-V-E-N-I-E-N-T. Very good, you get an A. <laughs> what are you looking up Convenient, mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm okay. typing convenient into a Google search. Okay. It's fitting in well with a person's needs, activities, and plans. Yeah. 
They said they do those things which are not convenient. Um, so no, they do. I'm talking about the spirit. That, this verse here, they gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. I don't so get things that. that are, things that are not fitting in well with a person's needs, activities, and plans. That's what right. I'm saying. It's not doing anything that's good for you. I I don't see how that's the but it's well you can, you can you can think of it as the reverse because one of the things I'm looking at because I saw the same uh, definition Elder Baber saw uh -huh. and what one of the similarities it says involving little trouble or effort so when you're not doing the things that are not convenient which is not involving little trouble effort you're doing the opposite you're doing things that's involving trouble and more lots effort. of effort. Oh, right. Okay, I get it. So yes. you're doing the reverse. You're doing the opposite of sin, which is going to lead you more effort mm -hmm. and more trouble. Right. Okay, I get you. Because convenient, it doing the good is is um, worshiping God and trusting in Christ and and believing right. in the Holy Spirit. I got it now. Okay, but they're not, so that's why it's not convenient because it's not right. a good thing that they're doing. Gotcha. Right. Okay. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Would it be kind of like God gave them over to a reprobate mind? to do things, to do those things which are not uh, repentable? They are repentable, but their mind will not let them repent of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's more like they're just so stuck in their ways and they, they just, that's all, they're just out of their mind, so this is right to them. Yeah, because remember, the only there's only one sin of which you can repent. Yeah, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. Correct. Mm -hmm. Every sin, other than that, you can repent of it. But what this mm -hmm. uh, what this is talking about is <clears throat> that your mind is so damaged that it won't even consider repenting. Mm -hmm. Not that it can't, but that it won't. Mm -hmm. They almost sound like they're the same thing, but they're really not. Mm -hmm. That's I like think your, this, this I don't know if I should, in my mind, I think this, the only, because again, I have to use examples within the, the Bible for me to sort of you know, understand I can't hear you, Deacon. Pharaoh's heart. It's not. He just. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that he didn't do that. He just knew Pharaoh's heart, which was prideful, and that he would not adhere to the principles of God due to the fact of one, they have many gods and many different things. So he knew what he was gonna turn back to. And so it's just like when God will reprobate mind, I think it's like what Terry and when she was talking about before is like when God sort of removes his hand from you, it's not that you don't have a thing, it's just that we're not being covered. And so your mind is just gonna do things regardless of how much truth comes to you. Moses was telling Pharaoh what's gonna happen. And there was some points he was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. But the pride in him was like, I'm not gonna do it. And this is what God knew. He knew what was in his heart. So I think to me, that's why I look at what that, you know, that rubber bait and that convenience was, you know, convenience part of Pharaoh would have been, okay, I'm gonna hear to Moses and do it. but. He didn't know God like that, nor was he going to give his life over to God like that because he was, you no, know, Pharaoh was considered as a God. 
So those type of things are, you know, not that he couldn't have done it. It's just that because of the position and the things he was doing and what was in his heart, he wasn't going to do it. So God's like, okay, I'm going to remove that for you. So I think that's where some of that, you know, what's what's convenient for a believer is not going to be the convenient for a someone whose heart may not be in that situation. I, I don't. That's how I see it in terms of I have to relate it to something like that. Yeah, that, that's a good example. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure. Yeah. There was something happened there. I don't know what happened. It put me on mute for a while and I couldn't hear folks and then I could and then I wasn't oh. sure if you could hear me. We lost Nina. Or is it just, I don't have everybody showing. Let's see. Uh, oh, Mila, Tina, Mary. Oh, I just. You're still yeah. there. Yeah, everybody just isn't showing here. Okay. All right. Um, again, that's uh, part one mm -hmm. is uh, the wrath of God part of it. The other part is this thing that I call in, you're incurring dire life consequences as a result mm -hmm. of your pride. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a few little subcategories there. We'll run through those fairly quickly. Um, one is it talks about, uh, I've got two verses that talk about violence associated with pride. Mm -hmm. uh, it says pride compasseth them about as a chain and violence covers, covereth them as a garment. Wow. Hmm. And it says only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. So that says that uh, pride can lead to violence. Why do you think that is? What about pride leads to violence? Um, because some that are prideful have to have the last word. <laughs> they have to show themselves better than everyone else, and it can actually cause, like, someone else that is prideful that they're in an argument with can be that same way. So that can actually cause into a big fight, which I've, I've actually seen in my own household and family, so. Okay. So everybody wants to be number one. Nobody wants to be number yeah. two. Yeah, they are, they're always right. They gotta have the last word. They have to have the last say. They have to, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that before myself. Um, if I may um, use serial killers as an example, um, a lot of them, you know, they committed these crimes, you know, shedding innocent blood, but a lot of them didn't want to take accountability for their actions either. And, you know, not taking accountability for your actions is a form of pride as well. Okay. Serial killers. Wow. I didn't expect yeah. to have serial killers brought up in this study. <laughs> <laughs> it popped right. into my mind so i was like how i was like how can i use this so holy spirit bless me just now <laughs> all right oh wait a minute hold on hold on you say serial killers popped into your mind and you're trying to figure out how to use it no like i because i really thought about like um ted bundy how he like didn't want to take accountability for killing all those innocent women like he would you know he was saying like in some of his interviews how you know, he was being possessed and stuff like that. But some of the some of the um the crimes he did commit, he was fully aware of what he did. And it, you know, it took some scrubbing and some digging and it, it all ended up coming out. You know, the truth ended up being revealed about the crimes and everything that happened. Um and I know I was talking to um one of the uh Pastor Bennett and he was just like basically saying like, you know, forgiveness and not forgiving and like not taking accountability for your actions, how, how they could be related to, uh, to pride. And we were having our own like sidebar conversation about that. Cause mm -hmm. I was just asking him like, you know, is this, is this a form of pride? And he was like, you know, I didn't think about it like that, but it is. So that's why 
it made me think of that conversation. That's how I tied it to the serial killers, and that's how I tied All right. it to them. All right. I got you now. I was okay. just thinking, you sitting there thinking about serial killers. No, sir. No, All sir. Right. No, sir. I'm good now. Thank you. Okay, the next area that I've got here is called being shamed and debased. Um, and this is the opposite of pride, of course. So what this says is that uh, the result of uh, God bringing you low and doing all the things from up above that we talked about and uh, incurring God's wrath is he basically brings you down to, to earth. Um, and somewhere in this set, there's that famous verse that we always hear about. Uh, pride goeth before destruction and the Holy Spirit before fall. That's what these are talking about. So Proverbs 11 and 2, uh, when pride cometh in, cometh shame. Uh, Jeremiah 13 and 9 through 10. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, after this manner, I will mar the pride of Judah uh, and the great pride of Jerusalem. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as a girdle which is good for nothing. Uh, that's an interesting one to me. Uh, what do you think that last uh, verse talking about? A girdle which is good for nothing. First off, in, the, in scripture, what's a girdle? It's supposed to suck everything in and not expose it. Uh, but not in scripture though. A, a girdle is something different in, in scripture. It's a specific thing. A girdle is a belt. So a belt that's oh, good. Oh, the belt of truth like to gird yeah. your way, to guard your loins with a belt of truth. That yes. belt, like that's what you're talking about, like with the armor of God. Yeah. Okay. Gird your loins. Yeah. So if a girdle isn't good for anything, it, it, it still kind of has the same impact as if it was what you were saying, though, uh, Nicole. Uh, without either one of those girdles, what happens? Stuff will be exposed. Exactly. Same result, regardless of which de definition of girdle you're talking about. So... You're going to be exposed now. Yeah, you know, it, it's good when you say that because just to, you're saying about that belt, that girdle, that was the biggest thing. That's why the first thing where he says when you put on the full armor of guard is full armor of guard. He said the belt of truth, which is the girdle, because that's the belt is the thing that holds everything in place. Right. And if that's not there, all your other armor is going to fall off. So that's why. Oh, that's no, not all the armor, not, not your all of the, you know, yeah. Right, but everything that's put it on there, just put on there from the top, whatever that's held on. That's why even when they use it in spiritual, when you're saying put on the belt of truth, truth is what's going to you be able. Truth is what's going to allow you to use all the other armament. And hey, that's good. Never looked at it that way. That's good. Yeah. But in the Roman times, the belt was what put solidified and held all the other garments when you, you know, from your pants, waist, the upper body and everything like that, other than, you know, the shield that is going to be on your hand, but everything else is going to be held together by that belt of truth. Because without truth, you can't use any of the other stuff. Right. And even in modern military, uh, there was the, uh, well, we called it load bearing equipment, which you, hung all of your equipment on, your flashlights, your uh, your uh, uh, gas mask, your uh, ammo pouches, everything uh, was hooked all together around under the belt and the straps that uh, hung over your shoulders that connected to it. So the belt, even in modern warfare, was very important. But without that, again, everything is exposed. Uh, Daniel 4 and 17, this is Nebuchadnezzar. Those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. This is the guy who was king of kings. The greatest king on earth. 
he recognized that if you're proud, you have to be careful because God's going to abase you. And he knew this because he was, he was yes, he was abased himself. In fact, Daniel 4 and 37, this is a, a verse that's right after the story of what happened to him. Anybody remember that story? What happened to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter four? He started acting like an animal. Yes. Right. And why did he do that? Why did that happen? Because I think it was the dream that he had made him prideful. Okay. He, he, it, it's interesting. If you go back and read the story, he actually, after the dream, he actually gave God credit for, uh, for uh, giving him power and authority. But then a year later, it says that he said how great he was and how he had come to power all on his own. So it, it wasn't really a result of the dream. It was a result of forgetting what he had said after the dream. Then he said that uh, he had done all of this on his own. And as soon as he said that, that's when uh, he was brought low and he became, he started acting like an animal and he was out of his right mind for seven years, crawling around on all fours, eating grass like an animal and living out in the woods. And uh, it took him seven years before he got his, his right mind back and became king again. But it was out of pride and taking credit for, uh, being who he was when it was God who made him king of kings and sent him to punish Israel for their, not Israel, to punish uh, Judah for their uh, sins against mm -hmm. God. That is amazing. He had to have been a really mighty, powerful king for them to allow him to be that way for seven years. And when he come out of it, he's still the king. Yeah. So that shows how much power that that man had. You know. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, mm -mm, he'd have been out. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think also it, it also just didn't just show his power. It also shows the grace of God because God could have not allowed him to be king again. Could have just been like, nope, you're done. Yeah. He didn't but have I mean, to that be was literally... for seven years. He could have been that way for the rest of his life. Or he could have right. died out there like that. Yeah, but like that was literally the grace and the mercy of God to restore him back to his position after those seven years. Right. And actually, if God hadn't restored him, we wouldn't have had this verse that we're reading right now. Because this verse was actually written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. Chapter four is really... Uh, even though it's in the book of Daniel, chapter four was actually uh, all quoted from Nebuchadnezzar himself. It's not Daniel, it's Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Daniel 5 and 20. When his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. This is someone else, again, referring to what happened in chapter four. Uh, Isaiah 13 and 11, I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of pride to cease and will lay low the haunt, haughtiness of the terrible. Again, God is saying, if you're prideful, uh, look out, I'm coming for you and I'm going to throw you down. And then Isaiah 2 and 12, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low. So again and again, we see that if you're haughty, you're proud, you're uh, taking credit where credit is not due, that God will bring you down low. If you don't do it yourself, God will do it for you. And Elder, I... I believe also that not only will God do it for you, but he'll just allow the enemy to continue to destroy you. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, we're coming I'm, up I'm, on I'm, that. I'm, 
We're coming I'm a up witness to, to that. Destruction yeah. is the next section. So that was very timely. So the next thing, besides being brought low, is the next phase is destruction. And first verse is Proverbs 16, 18, pride goeth before destruction, all this fear before fall. We talked about that one already. We're just not talking about knocking down a building. We're talking about destruction of a human life. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall hold, uphold the humble in spirit. So he will be brought low, destroyed. Um, Isaiah, he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. So this one's an interesting one. It talks specifically about everything that you built up will be brought down as well. And will be trodden underfoot. That shows the level of destruction. It won't just be damaged. It'll be brought down to be stepped upon. Not just by God, but uh, even by man. It's Isaiah 28 and 3. Jeremiah 49 and 16 says, Thy terribleness hath deceived thee in the pride of thine heart. O thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, thou holdest the height of the hill. Though thou shouldest make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, saith the Lord. In other words, no matter how high you think you are, even as high as the, uh, the nest of an eagle on the top of the mountain, that's not too high for God to bring you down and destroy you. Yep. How about President Bush? Um, the last one. <laughs> Trump. Trump. Yes. <laughs> he has to turn himself in next week for one of his crimes. Did you hear about that? Oh, I saw that. Yeah, this afternoon, right before. In fact, right oh, before. Oh, really? Good. For, uh, good. Right before I came upstairs for Bible study, they were talking about that on the TV. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, good. Um, now, this next one I, I think is interesting. Ezekiel 7, 10 through 11. Behold the day. Behold, it is come. That's that day, same day we were talking about up above, the day when God's going to come visit you. The morning has gone forth. The rod hath blown, blossomed. Pride hath budded. So you're proud now. Your pride is budded. You're, you're taking pride in all that you've done. Violence is risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, nor of their multitude, nor of any of theirs. Neither shall there be wailing for them. That last verse is pretty telling. It said, of everything that you've done in pride, none of it shall remain. But then the last verse says, not only that, Nobody else is going to be sorry for you. Oh, that was also President Nixon. <laughs> True. But, uh, well, it's that time. There's more verses that go on like this. But that then, what we just talked about, that's the fate of the proud. Um, they suffer God's wrath and they suffer uh life consequences and nothing that they do in pride is going to last uh, and when they fall their fall is going to be great and nobody's going to be sad for them who feels sad for a person who's always proud and and talking about how great they are when they fall down nobody in fact everybody's waiting for them to fall so that's the the fate of those who act in the wrong type of pride. So does anybody have any questions or any comments on what we talked about today? And uh, before we close, Tina, since this was your topic, do you think we've sufficiently covered everything that you wanted to talk about? Actually, Elder, it was a good discussion. Um, it would have been a little, I, I see that it could. we could go on and on about it. Yes. However, to determine on both sides, to summarize the whole thing, is the fact that there is 
a pride that a lot of people cannot identify with, even not so much in others, but in ourselves. We just wanted to, you know, keep that in that perspective of being able to identify. Sometimes we don't. And it's very important that we know what pride is. And then after that, there is a consequence. There is a wrath. And Lucifer was one of the ones that showed the very first, okay? However, um, it is very dangerous and it can be very, um, how we say, um, complicated if we're not able to at least be able to identify it and to give it to God. It doesn't have to be in front of everybody. I mean, a lot of people can identify by looking at each other. But it's not so much that, but it's mainly in ourselves. And there's and it is fixable. I mean, we can take it to God. We can take it okay. to the Lord and, and cast that down because it is very dangerous. A lot of times it's undetectable. It can be in ourselves. And it's very important that we know what it is. And that's all it is. I don't hear a whole lot about that. And that is a very dangerous sin. So how do we determine if we're being prideful? Well, we just read a lot of this information and what it looks like. Right. For one. Okay. However, I would say that we, we, we got to go back to a couple of weeks ago. Um, yes, sir. And remember the five I am statements of, uh, of Lucifer, because that's normally the way pride is going to display itself. We say, I am this, I did this, I was this, as opposed to saying, uh, God did this through me, or, or God, with God's help, I did this. So anytime it's I, 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 and it's absolutely. Done. So that's what we need to be on the lookout for and examining ourselves. Are we taking credit for things that really uh, are the the work of God in us, or, or are we giving God the credit that's due to Him uh, and, and not taking the credit to ourselves? And if we, we see ourselves. If we see ourselves or hear ourselves using the I word too much, that's when we need to ask for forgiveness and acknowledge God's authority, power, and contribution to all that we have done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I thank uh, everyone because... That was a good discussion, and I just love the newcomers. They were awesome. They came up with some good ones. N Nia and uh, 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 it was a charisma um, yes. and Elder uh, Deacon. I mean, that it's it's a good thing that we discuss these things because a lot of times some of us and Terry. I mean, that was an excellent, excellent outlook of what a lot of words mean in the Bible because we do have to be careful with that as well. Right. You know, just to be able to understand what it is. Okay. Yes. Thank and you I'm so much. I'm always wanting to look up words. I'm I'm always wanting to look up words. So I think that's awesome. If we don't understand it, absolutely, I'm going to have us look it up and, and figure it out. Because I don't want us to go off half cocked and misinterpret scripture because we're interpreting on our own. But yes, we sir. We should be always lean on the Holy Spirit to give us an understanding. And I, I think he's helped us a lot in the last couple of weeks. So Thank that's so all much. I have for tonight. Um, I guess next week we will get back into our uh, standard discussion again. So we'll, we'll jump back into Romans chapter 12, which is where we left off. I think verse four was where we were. So when I send out the announcement next week, I'll, I'll remind everybody of where we are. But uh, that's all I wanted to talk about tonight. As usual, especially for the f newcomers, what I will what I usually do at the end, and I usually do this at a quarter till we went a little over today, which is not unusual, unfortunately. Um, 
I open it up to anybody who has any other, uh, I guess, uh, topics or thoughts or anything that you think is of value to the other people who are in the study, something that happened to you, something that you read, heard, saw, experienced during the week that you think is worth sharing with the, the rest of the group. I always open it up for about 10 or 15 minutes. And this is not necessarily part of the Bible study. This is just a sharing time. So if you have something, uh, Nia, you got your hand raised, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to like talk about kind of what Bishop has been highlighting uh, as of lately about letting go and just like not worrying about like who may be paying attention to you during worship and just like allowing the worship to just, you know, be in the presence of God and just let it all out. And I know that's kind of like around the the topic of, of pride as well, because yeah. It is, it is. He was, he was speaking speaking a, a lot about that tonight by saying, you know, a lot of people really don't know how to let go. And like those three days we had with uh, Pastor Alexander kind of taught us, you know, through deliverance that it's really freeing to just let go. And even if it's even if it's like around, even if it has something to do with pride or just not naturally being able or taught to let go, it's it's. 100% of free feeling and just like you said you know just ask for forgiveness in those moments as you're wor right. worshiping you're out at the altar and you know sometimes you might end up on your face you might have snot running down your nose you know crying yeah. I mean that real ugly cry that's truly letting go of all of it especially pride being one of them because when you care about your appearance to other people are you're not really there for God you, you you're worried about the right. wrong thing Right. So I just I just thought that was really perfect how, you know, you've already been talking about like um, pride and everything, too. So it's just it's coming full circle for me. Oh, that's the way the spirit is. The spirit has seasons as well. So there's seasons when it will seem like everything you hear is, is touching on the same topic. It, it happens. And that's just confirmation that. Uh, it's the spirit that you're hearing and not yourself. Absolutely. So you, absolutely. Absolutely. You grasp all of those times and allow the spirit to speak to you and listen to what he's saying. Yes, sir. You know, sometimes my mind want to go there too. And I would say, and I just pray that God would just um, remove the focus. You know, and I'm just going to worry about praising him, you right. know, um, get them, pray for their heart that they will focus on God and just leave it at that. Yeah. Don't let it linger in your head because then you'll be all off doing praise and worship. Trust me, I, I've been there and that's why I have to fight it off. You know, I you have to develop tools where you um, bring yourself back around to where you're at and the reason you're doing it instead of lingering on that thought. Right. Yeah, you also have to be conscious of when your mind is wandering away from the worship and wandering towards other things, uh, towards uh, your own worries, towards uh, the people that are around you, towards worrying about what people are looking at and what people might be thinking of you. And sometimes you, you literally have to rebuke the enemy and uh, tell him that you're going to be in worship. And uh, just as Jesus had to tell Peter that one time, get thee behind me, Satan. Um, because sometimes that's what it is. Satan looks for that opportunity to, to jump in there and to, to distract you from worship. And you just have to recognize that that's all that is. That it's all it is. It's a distraction to, to take your focus away and say, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm in worship. Okay. Okay. I'm glad you said that. Because sometimes I feel real bad for thinking that about certain situations like, uh, get behind me, Satan. Even like, some things I hear out just just by being in the atmosphere you kind of like ah, get behind me saying this okay I'll be thinking that in my mind so I'm 
I don't know. I'm the only one that'd be thinking that. No, you shouldn't be the only one. No. No. And it's like one scripture I tell myself is like if my mind starts to wonder, like, first of all, I don't care what other people think of me while I'm in worship. If I'm on my knees, if I'm laid out on the floor, if I'm like crying with snot down my face, if I'm hunched over, I don't care because that's my time from God and no one's going to take that time away from me. Right. You know, I mean, that's that's my intimate worship time with my father. You know, that's me and Jesus time. That's me and the Holy Spirit time. That's me and daddy time. It's like no one's going to take that from me. And only he knows what's going on in me. And that's me and the spirit time. But like if there's a thought that tries to come in to distract me, I always just say I cast down every thought and imagination that exalts right. itself against the knowledge of God. And as that's soon as I say too. that. Absolutely. And as soon as I say that, it's like I'm back in that place. My, I mean, my spirit is like, re, re, you know, you know, it's like it's right there. So, you know, you just cast that town. But it's like I stopped caring what people think with me during worship. It's like I don't focus on nobody else. It's like I'm in my place. I'm in my place of worship. And that's me. And that's me and his. That's me and his time. Exactly. No, that's my time. That's my time and his time. That's all that matters. Um. Elder, uh, the other thing is, is there's a scripture that just came to my spirit concerning everything that was being shared. And, you know, we all quote Psalms 139, but it is the last part of Psalms 139. And it's a good way to like just test us to see where we're at. And like we were saying, like, how do we know if there's pride in us or whatever the case may be? And it's something that David said, and it's like, I love this part of Psalms 139, and it's the last part. And David's, David's crying out to God, and he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the, in the everlasting way. So it's like, Tina was saying it's like it's something that we got to check inside of us see if there's anything like if there's pride in us or whatever it's like search me God know my heart know me see if there's any anxious way anything wrong in me and let it be exposed right. and lead me in that everlasting way you know it's like That's David good. wanted to know that he knew that there wasn't anything wrong in him after the mistake he made you know, to just know that he was right with God. Exactly. So just to, you know, end it like, you know, just share that scripture. Cause that was just, that was kind of burning in my spirit. And that's Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Those who wanted to write it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. All right, uh, we're 10 minutes over, so I'm going to go ahead and close out. Uh, good study again tonight. Uh, again, uh, I'll send out the announcement next week to tell us where we're going to be. We'll be back into the, uh, the big, thick book. Um, Romans 12, and I believe chapter uh, verse, verse 4, but I'll send that out. So we'll go ahead and close out in prayer. Um, I'll go ahead and close out in prayer tonight and, and we'll meet again next week. Thanks again for everybody that came out. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you again for this time. Holy Spirit, we thank you for leading us into the word, for guiding us to the meaning of what it is that we studied for unfolding the word to our spirits so that we would understand better what it is that you would have us to understand from this word. Because as we have studied and learned during this last couple of weeks, it's not what we know that changes us, it's what we understand that changes our lives. So we thank you for giving us the understanding. Holy Spirit, we continue to give you full authority in this Bible study to guide us where you need us to go, to show us what you need us to see, to tell us what you need us to hear. And Father, we thank you again for giving us your word. We thank you again 
for giving us your spirit to interpret that word. And we thank you again for giving us your son who embodies that word. We thank you, Father, for these who have joined with us for this Bible study. We praise you, Father, for all that you're doing in our lives, all that you have blessed us with, all that you're doing to, through, and for us. And we give you every glory, every honor, every praise that's due to your name. We thank you once again, Father. We give you glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' holy and righteous name, we pray. Amen and amen. 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 All right. See everybody again next week. All right. Thank you, Elder. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good weekend. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Have a blessed week. You too. Good night.